Yeah, my name is Kai. Uh, I'm doing my PhD on guys clusters, as was just said. So I'm going to give you a quick whistle-stop tour of what galaxy clusters are, uh, why they're interesting, and how they helped us determine uh, some properties of dark matter, and specifically look at the example of the bullet cluster. Um, so galaxy clusters, uh, they're, they're groups of galaxies. So galaxies like our own are filled with stars, uh, and then galaxies themselves group around each other uh, and, and are locked. But I'll get into a quick introduction of, of sort of how they form. So we start with the Big Bang, uh, and we've got this sort of universe that that's quite smooth. There's 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 not too much difference in it. And I'll go ahead to a simulation now, and you see quite a smooth universe, but there's just small density fluctuations. So some bits of matter are just closer to other, but closer to each other than other bits. Uh, and over time, these slightly denser regions have collapsed in, ha have merged due to gravity, uh, and you get this structure growing. And that's what the simulation's showing. You've got these slightly dense bits. They're all flowing in, collapsing, forming super dense bits. And then there's this blue area, which is sort of empty as, the, as all the matter's leaving it and going into these, these denser regions. Um, and so that, then what we get is, is this sort of structure in the universe that we can see here. Uh, and, and there's these filaments where all, all the matters join together and right in, in the densest regions we get these galaxy clusters which over time are formed as all the matters come together, form stars, galaxy, galaxy clusters uh, uh, in, in this sort of structure uh, to create our universe. So if I just do a quick, this is another simulation going through uh, the universe, there you go, you just sort of, this is imagine you're flying through the universe uh, and these specks are all, they're all galaxy clusters, they're lumps of matter uh, and and so we're just tiny speck in, in this sort of large scale structure uh, and it's really important that we sort of understand galaxy clusters because they're the largest thing in the universe by knowing things about them we can understand the universe as a whole we can understand the, the history of the universe how everything formed uh, and understand cosmology is, is the field and this is an example of, of a really massive galaxy cluster in, in green uh, as everything's flown together and formed these massive structures now we'll go quickly back to uh, our human understanding of, of galaxy clusters. And we start in, in the 18th century. Uh, we're just looking at the sky. Some, some astro astronomers were able to sort of just note these, these clusters of essentially clouds in the sky, these little clouds they saw and they grouped together. Uh, and they assumed they were nebulae within our own galaxy. Uh, and it wasn't until here, 1919, when Hubble actually, he measured the, the velocity, the speed of these, uh, these nebulae in the sky and found they were going much too fast to possibly be inside our galaxy. And that's when we realized that there were other galaxies and these other galaxies were in groups. Uh, and this gave us an idea for large scale structure of the universe. Uh, and that's sort of what we're seeing here. Uh, and we can go to our own night sky in Bristol. Uh, we can see this nice view of the sky. These yellow circles are sort of galaxy clusters that you could see with your telescope in the garden if you had a nice telescope and the sky was clear, which is quite unlikely in Bristol. Uh, but this is the sort of structure you can see uh, from an amateur perspective. And then we go into the into the astrophysical realm where uh, we, we get loads of surveys in, in across different wavelengths. Uh, this is an optical example of an optical image of a galaxy cluster. Uh, and these surveys find, find thousands of galaxy clusters and clusters have hundreds of galaxies. And that's what we can see here in this image. Uh, these these sort of yellow specks are, are galaxies. You can see some of them have pretty shapes. They're, 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 they're looking good. Uh, and, and this is a nice example of a nice big galaxy cluster. Uh, and what's happening is, as I said, for all these galaxies are sort of falling into these clusters. And this is, this is uh, they're swarming around the center and they're all trapped to gravity. So they're in this sort of uh, potential well. So there's, there's a, a mass in the middle and they're all spinning around it. Uh, and the important thing from a uh, cosmological, so the history of the universe point of view, is finding out the mass of this cluster. Because if we can find out uh, in the filaments what the mass of everything was, we can find out how everything evolved from the initial smooth-ish image to what we see now. Uh, and so knowing the mass is the most important thing. And then we need a way to measure said mass. Uh, and I'll get onto the first uh, tool, which is redshift. Um, this is more common, like more intuitive. Uh, when an ambulance drives past you in the street, when it's coming towards you, it sounds completely different to when it's going away. Uh, and it, the same thing happens with light. So if, if light comes towards you, if you split it into its back, oh, I'll, actually, I'll get to that later. Just when, when light's coming towards you, because it's moving so fast towards you, all the, the, the waves are sort of crushed together. 
uh, and they become bluer. So if we can see on the spectrum, they're crushed together, which means they're moved to the left side of the spectrum so that they're, they're bluer. And if something's moving away from you, it's stretched out. All these waves are stretched and they move to the red side. Uh, and what we can do with light from galaxies is, uh, as Lily kind of explained earlier with spectrum, is we can split it across all the different wavelengths and we can see features from different elements, different molecules, uh, and we can see where these features are, and we know where they should be based on that. If, if we were just looking at the features from that element in the lab and it wasn't moving, we know what wavelength they should be, and we can compare it to the wavelength we're seeing from galaxies, and that shift, uh, which we call a red shift, so how much redder it is, says how fast something's moving away from us. Uh, and so this is what Zwicky did. Uh, he measured the, the galaxy but velocities of, of galaxies within groups so the ones moving so if, if they're swarming around the ones moving away from us at a moment have faster velocities ones moving towards us have slower velocities and 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 this is the sort of shape you got uh, and, and this is an all in the assumption that this all this velocity is from kinetic energy which has come from the galaxies falling in so from the potential energy so it's all from the mass uh, and, and what you found was, so if you look at all the galaxies, you get an amount of mass you're expecting for a galaxy group, because uh, you know roughly how much a galaxy weighs. Uh, but what he found was that the galaxy group actually was 100 times heavier than just from the galaxy. So there's something there that we can't see, and this is coined dark matter. Uh, and we know it's, it, it, we call it dark matter because we know it's nothing that we can see. We've tried different wavelengths, we just can't see it. And the only reason we know it's there is because of gravity. And then this is also proved by uh, Vega, who in the 1970s did the individual galaxies themselves and found the same thing. We know exactly how much like stars weigh uh, and we can see how much a galaxy is meant to weigh, but when you measure the, how fast it spins, it's spinning much faster. Uh, and so there's something there, this dark matter halo, which is giving extra gravity because it's got extra mass. And so we go back to our night sky and we want a different view. This is in the optical. Uh, and if we change to, if we could sort of have our X-ray glasses or get a satellite in space and look in the X-ray, we get this completely different view where the galaxy cluster before was just a, a small yellow, well, a group of yellow circles. It is now this large sort of cloud of hot gas. And to give you an idea of scale, that, that white square is roughly the size of the moon in the sky. So this is a, a massive structure despite being outside our galaxy. So really far away, it, it's a massive structure in the sky. Uh, and understanding the X-ray view is really important to understanding more about galaxy clusters. Because what we found, so in the 1960s, we launched X-ray satellites in the sky and we kept seeing these, these large clouds, gas clouds. Uh, and it's from, it's an X-ray uh, emission from all this hot gas within the clusters. Uh, and so here, this is a, the cluster I showed before, the visual, the optical view, so you can see the galaxies. If we change the X-ray view, we've just got this cloud of gas and it's really hot, hundreds of million kelvins. Uh, and we can measure the mass uh, of this gas because we can measure its temperature uh, and assuming it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, so it's, it's sort of, uh, it, it's, it's not, it's in a stable state, uh, we can measure roughly the mass. And we found actually the amount of gas, there's five times as much mass in the gas as there is in the galaxy. So that's a little bit of that lost mass, uh, but we still have a lot more. So this is our image of galaxy clusters. It's, they're the largest things, so we use them to represent the universe. We can understand the history of the universe from them. We find about 3% of the mass of galaxy clusters, and therefore the universe is in mass, it is in stars, so that's the galaxies that we can see in the optical. 12% is in gas, so that's what we saw with the X-ray, uh, but then 85% is this dark matter that we know very little about, and we're trying to, that's what we're trying to really understand. So now I'm going to move on to the bullet cluster uh, and why it's interesting, because it's, it's quite a cool cluster. Well, more, it's a collision of two clusters. So galaxy cluster collisions, when, when two clusters collide with each other, it's interesting because we're seeing what's happening when everything's interacting with each other. So you're getting galaxies going into galaxies, gas going into gas, and more interestingly, dark matter going into dark matter, because we can't do this in a lab. We can't go into the lab and sort of collide dark matter. Well, we, we try, but can't really. So this is an example in the sky where we can see it happening. Uh, and so the bullet cluster here is, is a high energy merger where two galaxy clusters have gone into each other really fast and we've got a snapshot of it happening. Uh, and so on the right, we've got this small bullet cluster and a sort of shock front. So the small bullet shaped cluster has passed through a massive cluster. Uh, and it's got this sharp defined edge where, where the gas, this, so this is the X-ray view, so what you're seeing is the gas and the gas has passed through uh, and ionized and formed this sharp shock front edge uh, and it looks like a bullet. 
So that was the x-ray view. What does the optical view look like? Uh, and that's on the left here. So we can see all these galaxies uh, in the left view. And if we look, if we squint and look carefully, we can see two sort of clusterings of galaxies. There's, there's one on the left there, the larger one, and there's one on the right. And so we're thinking, well, what happened in the optical compared to the x-ray? So we can overlay the two images. And this is what we see. And this is really interesting because the first thing that's told us is, well, the galaxies haven't interacted. They've passed through each other and they've, they've essentially ignored each other. The gaps between galaxies are big enough that they, they don't collide. Whereas the gas has completely collided, formed this shock front and this bullet. And now the gas and the galaxies are in different positions in the sky. Uh, and then we've got to think, well, okay, let's look at dark matter. How can we look at the dark matter and see what's happened from that? Does it interact? What's it like? Is it like the gas or is it like the galaxies? And to do that, we need a technique to observe dark matter, which as I said before, we can't observe it. So how would we? And we know the only way we can observe it is by its effect on, on due to gravity. So we need another technique, which is called gravitational lensing. Uh, <laughs> gravitational lensing is, is fairly a fairly complex thing to understand but the simple way to to understand it is if you've got this um if you've got like a glass of water on some grid paper you see it all curves and the same thing's happening in the night sky and um, so we know that sort of the gravity bends light through space uh, and so here we go if we zoom in on this image of, of a galaxy cluster you see these curved shapes and these are actually galaxies behind the galaxy cluster the light from those galaxies so they'd normally look like normal normal galaxies the light's coming towards us and it's been bent and curved uh, and given these really cool shapes and from this we can figure out well if it, we can retrace the steps of the light and go this is how much mass has to be in that area uh, just from pretty much mostly dark matter. We know it's 85% dark matter, so it's mostly dark matter. We can calculate that mass then based on how it's bent the light. Uh, and from that, we, we know, well, this is where the mass is and this is how much it is. And so let's apply that to the bullet cluster. And this is what we see, which on its own is really interesting. You're seeing the two clusters quite clearly. You're seeing this, the left one is, is more massive it's, uh, and the right one's smaller. They've passed through each other, but we don't really have any evidence of interaction. But the best way to tell if they interacted or not is to overlay them with the optical image. And that's what we sort of see here. We've got all three images on top of each other. Uh, and if we recall where the location of the galaxy, like the galaxies themselves was, they were further apart than the gas. And that's what we're seeing with the dark matter. So the dark matter has clearly not interacted with itself. Um, and this means it's, it's <laughs> we found another property of dark matter. We found out dark matter doesn't interact even with itself. It's really, it's viscous, it, 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 it's really, it just doesn't interact with anything, um, which helps to explain why we just can't see it ever. Uh, and so I'll just show a quick simulation of what we're seeing with bullet cluster. The blue is the dark matter, the, the reddish is the gas. And you can see this gas is all colliding, it's, it's heating up, it, it's all being perturbed, but the dark matter is just staying unaffected. <laughs> it, it just doesn't really like care what's happening. And we're just, we're just seeing different angles uh, and you can sort of see how, how the image came. If you took a snapshot of this, that's what we see in the night sky. And, and this is our attempts at reproducing what we see in the night sky. There we go. So, so yeah, it's, it's giving some interesting insight into dark matter and some properties of it. Uh, so now I'll just quickly say before I finish uh, our best idea of what is dark matter. Um, so our current best bet is what we call WIMPs, so weakly interacting massive particles. Uh, so they're much heavier than the, your typical particles like proton, 10 to 100 times the mass of it. Uh, and they're sort of everywhere. They're, they're passing through us all the time because we already know there's dark matter in the galaxy. Um, but we can't see them. They don't interact with anything. They just pass through everything uh, oblivious. Uh, and so <laughs> trying to spot them is really hard. We can either go for, for these rare interactions. And in order to maximize the attempt of a rare interaction, we go somewhere where there's no particles. So if we go right down into the Earth, it's far, there's far less happening down there because everything from the sky is being absorbed by the Earth. Uh, and so once you get down there, the chances, so even though it, something happening is really unlikely, there's less background noise. So when we do see something, we're more likely, it's more likely to be something we're more likely to spot it. 
Uh, the other idea is in the sky, the, these wimps are in the sky and anti-wimps, and if they collide with each other, they're very rare again, they might emit high energy particles, and if we spot them, we can reconstruct where they came from and get an idea of both things. Uh, the final one is to make some, and this is where the Large Hadron Collider comes in that we know about. It's two beams of protons hit each other, they, they um, collide, explode, and we capture all of the things they emit apart from the dark matter. So from that, the thing we're missing is clearly dark matter. And so we can understand something about dark matter by just looking at what's not left over at the end. Uh, and so what we're doing with all these things is we're just sort of ruling out different options. We're not, we're not quite finding the correct answer, but we're ruling out different things and we're zone, zooming in on what might be the correct answer. Uh, and yeah, I'll just end with a summary that, so we found out that about 85% of the mass of the universe is in dark matter. It's this thing that we know very little about. Uh, it does clump together in galaxies and clusters, as you can see in the blue on the right here. And it, it really doesn't interact much with itself or, or normal matter. The only reason we know it exists is because of gravity. We're seeing it bend light. We're seeing it um, make galaxies spin around each other faster than they should. Uh, and our most likely explanation for what it is, is that it's a wimp a weakly interactive massive particle. Thank you. What are some examples of anti-wimps? Uh, <laughs> very good question. Uh, you, you've gone, uh, unfortunately, you've gone into the area of particle physics, which is certainly not my speciality. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, mainly the, the idea being that most particles ha have an, an anti-version of themselves uh, and it's it's essentially the exact opposite and if they collide they they sort of remove each other <laughs> so it, as much as we don't know what a wimp is the anti-wimp would just be the, the opposite of it <laughs> it's a good question and it's beyond my ability to answer fully <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's all right I think it's always good to admit when we don't know the answer to something, and I suppose there's a lot about uh, antimatter that we don't know, so that's cool. I mean, my question is a little bit simpler than that. I, I was wondering about, you mentioned that there's something in the middle of these galaxy clusters that, you know, is maybe holding them together. Is, do we have any idea what that is? Or is it just there's more of them close to the middle? Uh, you know. So the, the simulation at the beginning was just general matter and it sort of just falls into these lumps uh, and so it's mostly dark matter <laughs> is what we sort of showed and then there's also gas there it's just sort of uh, the mass has lumped together because it's more massive uh, and so gravity is just holding it together and galaxies are the thing we see more intuitively and they tend to be further apart but it's it's just gas hot gas there's typically one big galaxy in the middle i call the brightest cluster galaxy but it's all just sort of yeah, it's just a bit of everything is is lumped together from from the initial smooth universe that had little bits of like lumpage. The, these lumpage just got bigger over time. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is probably a fairly obvious answer to this one, but I'm assuming that we're in a galaxy cluster ourselves. So can we look at our galaxy cluster to find out more about the more distant ones, or is it better to look at the ones further away to find out? Yeah, we we we're in one. We we do look at our own. I think our own is quite a, a relatively small one. Um, also, being in something is you can study it, but you, what we more like to study is sort of large numbers of things. So you get large number statistics. So you're seeing a bigger picture because any one thing could be completely different. But if you look outwards, you can see lots of clusters. So you can understand what happens generally rather than specifically our case. But yes, we, we can look at our own. Yeah. 